Just amazing to see the connectivity and the support that uh, so many in this field give to one another. We say that everybody in this field, it's a, it's a magnet for purpose, passion-driven people who light one another's candles. And I think that is so very true. So our next speaker is the president of the Nutritional Research Foundation. He's a New York Times best-selling author, a PBS personality, someone that you've seen probably often on the Dr. Oz show. He promotes a nutrient-dense, plant-rich dietary lifestyle. He even coined the Nutritarian Diet. His book, Eat to Live, and many others have truly been an inspiration for beginning to transform health of Americans and people around the world. So please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Joel Furman. Okay, nice to see all of you today. Okay, I'm going to be speaking pretty rapidly to review some of the, this new advances in nutritional science that enables us to control our health destiny, age slower, maintain our full mental and physical capacity as we age. But also, during this presentation today, we're going to focus on why people have trouble obtaining an ideal weight and what are the biological and biochemical factors that lead to overeating behaviors and food addiction. Because right now, you have an unprecedented opportunity in human history to live longer and healthier than ever before and while we have this advances in science telling us exactly what to do, people are choosing to commit suicide with food. And the fast food revolution is creating mental illness. It drives violence, obesity, depression, and bizarre thinking and bad choices, including an unrelenting desire to overconsume calories. So we're going to put some of that together today. And hopefully you'll leave here with a better understanding to care for your own patients, your own people you desire to have an effect, a positive effect on, and have more knowledge that you can put into action to help people not just lose weight, but maintain their weight loss and enjoy eating healthfully for the rest of their life. So with that as an introduction, let's get started. Food gives us nutrients, of course, and there's two types of nutrients in food. There's macronutrients, and there's micronutrients. Now, macronutrients are, the word macro means large, and macronutrients contain calories, like fat, carbohydrate, and protein. Those are the three basic macronutrients. And one thing we know for sure, that the more macronutrients you eat, the shorter you live. They say, the longer your waistline, the shorter your lifeline. That we know fat on the body accelerates aging, and fat cells secrete inflammatory substances that affect our brain to make us lose brain cells. Fat makes us insulin resistant. So now the pancreas has to respond to almost anything you eat with more insulin. And higher amounts of insulin promote angiogenesis. And the word angiogenesis means the, to promote the growth of new blood vessels, to fuel the growth of fat. So insulin is very fat promoting, and insulin promotes cancers and heart disease and dementia, excess insulin that is. Now the fat cells secrete these lipokines and cytokines that are so inflammatory that they stimulate the production of a system of hormones called aromatase. And the aromatase system produces more estrogen. So when you're overweight, you're producing higher levels of estrogen, and higher levels of estrogen stimulate breast tissue and prostate tissue to lead to prostate cancer and breast cancer. What I'm saying right now is that being overweight and consuming so too many calories increases the risk of cancer, right, to multiple mechanisms. So I'm saying here like olive oil. Olive oil is breast cancer promoting. The reason olive oil promotes breast cancer is because it's concentrated calories, you absorb it very rapidly, and whenever we eat concentrated calories that are absorbed rapidly, they stimulate the appetite to eat more food. If you ate, let's say, walnuts instead of walnut oil, or olives instead of olive oil, or pistachios instead of pistachio nut oil, if you have the whole nut or seed, the calories are absorbed more slowly, so your body can, so it can, the appetite has a chance to control itself and respond to those calories thus ingested. Whereas when we're eating oils, they're absorbed so rapidly that the body doesn't, doesn't ratchet down its appetite. 
and it stimulates the, over the overeating of food. Like for example, if you guys were coming to the buffet and you were filling up your plates, but while you were waiting to get your food to the buff on the buffet, I gave you a tablespoon of olive oil to take while you were waiting to get your food, you would not consume 120 calories less in the buffet because the olive oil has no effect to react to down the appetite. On the other hand, if I gave you guys an apple to eat on your way to the buffet, and the scientists were recording how much calories you ate at the meal, they would find out that you would eat 65 calories less because the apple has fiber, weight, nutrients, and it takes time to digest it, and you, were, you would eat less food at the buffet based on how much apple you consumed on your way here. But if I mix the olive oil in the food on the buffet, you would naturally not just get 120 calories extra, but you'd also eat more food on the buffet. You'd get two, more than 200 calories extra on the average because oil is an appetite stimulant. So in general, we're saying here that certain food drives up the appetite and the, basically the more rapidly those calories are absorbed into your bloodstream, the more appetite stimulation you're going to get. So they were talking about excess macronutrients here and how excess macronutrients shortens life and drives appetite and overeating behavior. And micronutrients do not contain calories, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals we get from an assortment of colorful plant foods. And these have the opposite effect because we're talking about during this presentation that the higher our micronutrient per calorie ratio of our diet, the more we have a high micronutrient bang per caloric buck, the more it lowers our appetite, we're able to stop that craving for wanting excess calories, because when you don't get enough micronutrients, when you are ubiquitously deficient in phytochemicals and antioxidants, like most Americans are, you become a calorie-consuming monster, and you can't control how much you're eating, and you naturally become overweight, and being overweight accelerates your death. So what I'm saying right now in this very first principle of a nutritarian diet is this. The most proven methodology to slow aging and to extend human lifespan is, and I want you to write this down, is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. That's what you should be able to parrot back at me. Moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. Because what I'm telling you right now is that as you achieve micronutrient excellence, it naturally has you desire the right amount of calories. You stop wanting to overeat all the time because your micronutrients are met, your fiber needs are met, and when you're eating the right fiber and micronutrients and the right amount of natural foods, there's a lot of different mechanisms via which the body can register and control how much calories you eat. For example, when you digest fiber from plants like mushrooms and beans and greens, you produce short-chain fatty acids, predominantly butyrate. In other words, the bacteria in the gut that eat up those fibers and the indigestible materials in those foods produce butyrate, and butyrate signals the hypothalamus, the base part of your brain, the apostat controller, to ratchet down and have you desire less calories. Without those nutrients, without those fibers, you're left with no appetite control. So the first principle of a nutritarian diet the most principle that most governs your lifespan and your longevity is H equals N over C. That means your healthy life expectancy, how long you're going to live and the quality of your life as you age, is proportional to the micronutrient per calorie density of your diet. We're looking to strive to eat natural foods that have their full assortment of, of phytochemicals, that full symphony of phytochemicals, and that's when you achieve the greatest health and you desire the right amount of calories, not too much. Now the American diet, the standard American diet, or SAD, couldn't be better designed to kill people had it been designed by ISIS. By the way, I said that on television, I said on my PBS show, I said, this diet's been designed by Al-Qaeda. But they cut that out. Just to let you know that wasn't me talking, they dubbed in a voice that said, just you know, it wasn't my joke. My joke was that this diet's been designed by Al-Qaeda, so don't blame me for that bad joke. It came across and it said, this diet's been designed by Darth Vader. <laughs> Not that terrible, but it wasn't as good as Al-Qaeda. By the way, the joke doesn't have to be so funny because if you laugh and smile anyway, it may, still makes you live longer because laughing and smiling is good for your health. The joke could be stupid. 
Just laugh anyway. Good, good work. All right, so I always say, we've landed the man on the moon already. And you know what I mean by that? I mean that we already know how to win the war on cancer. We have that information in our, in our knowledge base. But the answer is vegetables. And people don't like that answer. They want a different answer on how to win the war. They don't want to hear that you have to eat vegetables. They want to hear, well, I want a magic pill I could take so I can not smoke three packs of cigarettes a day and not get lung cancer. Oh, so I can eat um, potato chips and pretzels and pizza and donuts and hamburgers and, and not get breast cancer. But it's never going to happen. We don't live in a fairy tale. This isn't magic, a magical land. This is reality. And in reality, you eat those foods, you get what you, you earn, those diseases, and you get them. So you can see by this slide that we eat predominantly processed foods and animal products with only about 10% of calories from whole plant foods. But that whole 10% of calories from whole plant foods is half white potato and ketchup, and we only eat about 2% of calories from vegetables in this country. Thus, the explanation for this explosion in cancer and obesity that still climbs because we know that it's a seesaw relationship that as you eat more vegetables, you desire less calories in your diet and you get better appetite control. And as you eat more processed foods and fast foods and lower nutrient foods, you desire more calories in direct proportion to that. This is not that complicated. And what I'm saying here, a piece of chicken is just like a bagel. And why am I saying a piece of chicken is like a bagel? Why? Nobody? Right, because neither one contains a significant load of micronutrients. They're both rich sources of calories or macronutrients. The bagel has carbohydrate in it, the chicken is full of protein, but neither one gives you a significant source of micronutrients like vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants because all the phytochemicals and antioxidants that protect against cancer are found in colorful plants, not in animal products and not in processed foods like bread and pasta and white rice and chips and soft drinks and whatever people are eating, pretzels, donuts, cookies, crackers, right? Putting empty calories. The more empty calories you eat in your life, the more you shorten your life. So that bail you're eating over there and that, those chips and that, you know, those, every time you have white rice and bagels and chips and, and vegan junk food, you're shortening your life because there's no nutrients in there, especially when they're high glycemic carbohydrates. Just as bad as eating animal products. It's natural plant foods that give us the ability to live a long life. So high nutrient, low calorie intake, slows the aging process, enhances DNA repair, stops the cross-linking and the buildup of methylation defects, and enables the body to reverse methylation defects and broken DNA cross-links. And you know what? The high intake of green, and green vegetables and mushrooms and onions and these high phytochemicals and plant foods not only have antioxidant effects and increase cellular repair, but they suppress genetic alterations. They don't allow them to be expressed. When you have the GSTP1 gene for breast cancer, that gene gets hidden and compressed. It can't cause a problem when you have a high intake of vegetables in your diet. So if I asked you over here, what's the food that has the most powerful effect to prevent cancer, what would you answer? Vegetables, but particularly green vegetables. And I have to ask you guys over here, here, what's the food that's most actively protective against heart attacks and strokes? What food would you say? Vegetables and green vegetables are the most richest, the same food. It's not, it's, it's, it's not that complicated. We need a diet rich in colorful vegetables, especially green vegetables. Believe it or not, our body is dependent on green vegetables for the activation of the antioxidant response element, the ARE in our cells that works to keep the cells clean and repair damage, is fueled by the consumption of vegetable greens and other colorful plants. Without those, we are not normal. You can't be normal if you're not eating sufficiently of green vegetables. And if you do, don't want to eat vegetables, you don't like vegetables, then you better live close to a hospital. Now, that's a joke because because living close to a hospital is not going to help you live longer anyway. It doesn't even make sense, that joke. What about that slide that says slows the metabolic rate? What's that all about, slows the metabolic rate? Is it better to have a fast metabolic rate or a slow metabolic rate? What do you guys think? That's right. Here, look at me. Take my body, for example. If I gain, let's say I ate 200 calories extra over and above what my body needs each day. 2,000 calories times 365 days at 3,500 calories a pound. That means I gained 20 pounds over that year from the 200 calories a day. I gained 20 pounds from going 200 calories over my, over my basic metabolic rate. So am I going to gain 20 pounds with those extra 200 calories? Am I going to do that? 
No, because as you increase the calories, the body will speed up the metabolic rate to burn off some of those calories so they won't all become poundage on the body. So only gain 10 pounds, not the 20 pounds I was supposed to gain. Did you get that? Now what if I'm eating my, my basal metabolic rate and I undershoot those calories by 100 calories a day? Do I lose 10 pounds that year? No. My body's going to work hard to slow down its metabolism to not to lose that much weight because I already exercise and I have, and my body wants to maintain the muscle structure and I'm already down to a low body fat. So my body's going to actively resist getting thinner because this is the most favorable weight for me and the amount of muscles I demand from the activities I do. So my body will slow down its metabolic rate. It'll lower the thyroid hormone a little bit. My body temperature will lower a drop. My respiratory quotient, the amount of calories burned by respirations will lower. My body will conserve calories to, and I'll slow the metabolic rate because our metabolic rate is the rate at which we age and now I'll slow the aging process and age slower. That's why I'm already 104 years old. But let me tell you something right now, because people are all, all confused about nutrition. They're trying to use some gimmick, fad, or trick to speed up the metabolic rate so they can eat more calories and not get fat. That's not your, that's your um, formula for early death. What you really should be trying to do is to eat super healthy so you can comfortably eat a little less calories, so you can slow down your metabolic rate and not get too thin. Did you follow that? Because when you do that, it stabilizes your muscle, it strengthens your bones, it doesn't weaken them, it actually makes less bone turnover. So now if I'm in a car accident or I get a pneumonia or I have to be in the hospital for some horrible thing, you have more stabilization of your bone mass and your muscle mass. You can lose less muscle mass, not more. You have your metabolic rate is more, is more stable. Completely the opposite of what most people are thinking. Your bones are strengthened by the exposure to these healthy plant foods when you don't overly stimulate them with growth hormones. So what I'm saying right now is that these extra hormones, particularly estrogen, insulin, and IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one from eating too much animal protein, those stimulate turnover of muscle, muscle growth, bone turnover, lack of stability, and of course, promotion of cellular replication and promotion of cancer as they age the brain. We want our hormones to be lower, at the lower levels of normal. For example, remember I told you just a second ago, slowing the metabolic rate, your body lowers the thyroid function? What most people don't aware of, even physicians, how many physicians are here in the audience? Raise your hand. Okay, you doctors, a great, a lot of doctors, in the normal range of T4, right? What I'm saying right here, in the bottom half of normal, of T4, you have half the heart attack rates compared to people in the upper half of normal, of T4, of free T4. Did you follow that? It's better to have your body be, your thyroid be slightly on the slow side of normal. Not, not out of the normal range, but it's contrary to what people's thinking about because they learn things in nutrition that aren't quite accurate. So now I'm saying that vegetables have anti-inflammatory effects in the endothelium. They vasodilate, they increase blood flow. Popeye was right. When you eat greens, you get instantaneous increased cellular efficiency of oxygenation of tissues when you're eating these vegetables. And a lot of different studies show that vegetables, the green vegetables, because of their phytochemicals, especially the isothiocyanides, feeding the antioxidant response element, prevent plaque from being able to stick to the blood vessel wall and keep your, your blood vessels clean of plaque buildup. I'm oversimplifying that, but I don't have time to go into the mechanisms. But just like vegetables protect mostly against heart disease, vegetables are also protective against cancer because there's multiple, more than a couple of, more than there's hundreds of studies that show the link between green vegetables and other raw vegetables of all color and their, and their activation of anti-cancer mechanisms in the cell that enables us to not just live age well, but age without fear and age without worry of getting cancer, we, our body is already cancer resistant. We don't have to live with fear of heart disease and cancer. It's not normal to get these diseases that other Americans get. And the same factors that create these diseases create this food addiction mentality. We have a nation of food addicts that live to eat, right? They, can't, they live just to get, they recreate with food, they overeat food, and they can't stop eating it. So as you put on subcutaneous fat, you also put on visceral fat in your organs, in and around, under the abdominal wall. 
that surrounds your heart and as the lay, you lay down fat on the interior wall of the blood vessels and the exterior wall of the blood vessels, limiting their, their movement or an excursion. You, you lose, lose elasticity of tissue, especially as you put on visceral fat. And as you lose weight, the visceral fat doesn't come off that easy. You mostly take off the subcutaneous fat more effectively than you take off visceral fat. And then you gain weight, you can only gain subcutaneous fat at a certain rate, so your body puts on a lot of visceral fat. So as you lose weight and gain again and lose weight and regain again, you shift fat more viscerally, which is more saturated, which is more cholesterol producing, which is more cancer production and more heart disease producing, as our fat becomes more visceral. What I'm saying to you right now is that dieting is dangerous and we have to encourage our patients to eat to live. We have to encourage our patients to eat to prevent cancer, to eat to prevent heart disease, and to change, to make dietary changes that they maintain for the rest of their life. We're eating for great health, and the side effect is we gravitate towards an ideal weight because we eventually desire less calories as we keep improving the nutritional quality of what we eat. Now the formula, if you want to gain weight, is 2S plus O. If you want to put weight on, then you should eat a lot of sugar, salt, and sweeteners. Sweeteners, like sugar, salt, and oil, have us gain weight. What you're learning from me is that when you take in marshmallows and white bread, and there's not significant difference between white bread and marshmallows, it's the same thing. Sugar rushes into the bloodstream very rapidly, and when the sugar rushes in rapidly, the body registers that flux of calories like a bolus. Like a bolus is when a doctor injects the medications in a needle or in a drip that goes in all at one time, as opposed to hanging a bag and having the medications drip in at a little drop, taking like eight hours to go into you. It comes in all at once. When the calories enter all at once, they have a stimulating effect on dopamine in the brain, like you snorted cocaine or snorted talking an opiate and the brain doesn't differentiate what the cause of the stimulation is, it just registers a stimulatory effect and over time and it makes you want to desire more food. And over time you become more dopamine insensitive and you desire more ice cream and more pizza and more food and more burgers and more, you want more and more and larger amounts of food because of, the, because of this dopamine stimulation of the brain and that's the first phase of the addictive cycle is the excessive stimulation of dopamine in the brain especially by sweeteners and oils, because when you eat um, vegetable oils, the calories are absorbed so rapidly, they say from three to five minutes of absorption, that means from the lips to the hips, in three minutes flat. And then when you're, when you're exercising and not eating, they doesn't come, you don't take fat off your body, you use up the glycogen stores preferentially in your liver and your muscle tissue. Fat stores come off secondary after most of your glycogen is gone. And most people are eating so frequently, they're never taking fat off. What I'm telling you right now is the chronic use of oil in the diet inhibits the loss of body weight. So constantly pouring oil, olive oil over your food makes it almost impossible to get your extra weight off. And in soybean oil use has increased a thousand fold since 100 years ago. What I'm saying right now, too, is that 100 years ago, when we didn't use processed oils and all these sugars and processed foods, one in a hundred Americans were mentally ill. One in a hundred. Now we have one in five Americans are mentally ill. And the drive between processed foods and fast food and mental illness is very solid. Matter of fact, the consumption of commercial baked goods like bagels and croissants and pizza and fast food is linked to mental illness in a dose-dependent fashion. So that even depression, your risk of depression goes up about 50% of lifetime risk of depression just from the two, time, two servings a week of commercial baked goods or fast food. Did you follow that? Almost all of America, you know, with all these people eating fast food three or commercial baked goods three to seven times a week or more, how come they're not all depressed? Well, they are. They're all, they're not totally depressed, but they have dysthymia. In other words, the whole population has an epidemic of dysthymia, which means they're not really depressed, but they're not too excited about life either. Easy. They're easily angered. They have, they have a very flat affect. They're not too thrilled about life and they live either to eat, to drink, to snort, or whatever they're doing, they're not enjoying their life and not creatively having fun, play, and really thinking about what they can do for humanity, how they can further their own abilities, how they can enjoy and enjoy the aesthetic structure of the world, and care for and nurture other people's wholeness, wellness, and emotional well-being. They're not interested in that anymore. 
They're just serving themselves because the more you're addicted, the more selfish and self-centered you become as you just live to strive for your own personal addictive satisfaction. Addiction is an ethical dilemma too. And overeating and living on junk food and being addicted to food takes away person's personality. The people aren't the people they could have been. They're a mere shadow of themselves. The more you eat junk food and the more you eat highly glycemic carbohydrates, you destroy brain cells a little bit at a time and you become dumber and dumber and dumber. And then you get elected president. <laughs> All right, high volume foods raw vegetables, cooked greens, fresh fruits, mushrooms, eggplant, tomatoes. These foods take up a lot of space in your stomach. Your stomach can only fit a liter of food in there, right? You can't put that many calories in at one time. 400 calories of oil, you can put like 4,000 calories of food in your stomach. 4,000 calories of chicken or meat in your stomach. But you can't fit that much vegetables in there. When you eat a diet high in vegetables and beans and mushrooms and onions and melons and, and oranges and the space occupying but also the stretch receptors and the nutrient receptors are stimulated and you desire less calories. It's impossible to be overweight if you're eating all the nutrients, you need all the right kind of foods are in your diet. And that's how I figured out with a lot of years of scientific thought and contemplation that Skipper never really lived on that island. So to avoid overeating on high calorie food, we want to fill up on nutrient rich foods. We want to eat because we have stretch receptors, we have nutrient receptors, we have the, the fibers are broken down by bacteria, we have you know, receptors for, for butyrate, we have all types of triggers that keep our cal your apostat in control. You're not without any friends here or partners in, in getting you at a favorable weight. Your body wants to be a favorable weight. You just have to eat the healthy foods and stay away from these fast foods like sugar and white flour and white rice and oil and get most of your carbohydrates from foods that contain fiber and slowly digestible carbohydrates like are in beans. If we score carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of quality based on how much slowly digestible starches they have, and how much resistant starch is in there, and how much fiber is in there, that beans and lentils win the prize by a mile. Because their carbohydrates, they're absorbed so slowly that they don't require excess insulin. They make us feel full. And you know what? All those resistant starch calories aren't even biologically accessible to the body. Let me just explain this for a minute. That when you see 100 calories a cup, or 100 calories of beans, it's actually half a cup, but when you see 100 calories of beans, marked on the label, those 100 calories don't all come into you. You feel like you ate 100 calories, it ratcheted down your appetite by 100 calories, but because some of those calories are resistant starch, those calories get turned by bacteria into short-chain fatty acids that come out in the toilet bowl that don't get absorbed because they're converted so far down in the digestive tract that they're no longer biologically accessible. And you know what? When you eat nuts and seeds to get your fat instead of oil, the same thing happens because instead of the oils 100% biologically accessible, but when you eat nuts and seeds, the, the sterols and the stanols bind fat and so strongly do they bind that fat that a lot of those fat calories get absorbed and goes into the toilet bowl. They don't even all come in. Sure, you ratchet down your appetite by those 100 calories, but all those calories never even came into the body. So it automatically and moderately makes you calorically restricted. Makes you, it makes it very hard to overeat when you're eating these, these correct foods. But now, when you eat foods that do not contain a significant load of micronutrients, phytochemicals, antioxidants, you build up toxic waste products. And the primary waste products we talk about the most are free radicals like reactive oxygen species that build up when we don't consume a diet with enough antioxidants and phytochemicals. And the other toxin we talk about a lot in healthcare are advanced glycation end products. Because the glands glycation end products are what build up and may cause the diabetic to get nerve damage in their leg, to develop gastroparesis, to get kidney failure, to get, become blind, because we build up these glycation end products that build up and age us when we're not diabetic. These, we body gets glucose type um, compounds that, that, uh, that attach to our tissues and proteins that age us very rapidly. But the body doesn't allow that to occur and it works chronically to remove those toxins when we eat a healthy diet and we don't overeat. So we build up these toxins that the body is always looking to remove. 
And of course, we get toxins from eating fast food and processed foods and processed meats, and we get barbecue and we bake and cook things at high temperatures, especially when you cook meats and you flame broil them or, or you barbecue them or you fry them or you, you form heterocyclic amines and polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And of course, they add sodium benzoate to white bread, in this country at least. They don't add sodium benzoate to white bread. McDonald's doesn't add it anymore because they use the same burger buns in Europe and they don't allow it in Europe. So they started taking sodium benzoate out of their bread in the United States. They wouldn't have to separate the two manufacturing facilities. But any kind of white bread you buy in the supermarket has sodium benzoate in it. But we have, like our country has more carcinogens in our food supply than they do in other countries. They don't permit them as many. Like they don't allow in schoolrooms, cafeterias across the world, most of the countries no, don't allow processed meats because they're a class one carcinogen by the World Health Organization. But we allow them in this country and we encourage them in the food plans. You know, we're, our country is much more, um, more dangerous foods are available, especially to children. But the point I'm making right now, as we're moving forward here, I'm saying there are two phases to food addiction. One is the high caloric rush leading to the dopamine surge and dopamine insensitivity driving us to overeat. And secondly, is how ill we feel, shaky and weak and fatigued and anxiety and stomach cramping and headachey from withdrawal from the toxins, particularly reactive oxygen species and advanced location end products. So what I'm saying right now is that there are two phases of the digestive cycle. The anabolic phase while we're eating and digesting food, and that's when the body's busy taking calories in, and we're not in a detox mode. We're in, a, we're in an anabolic phase of building things or putting things into the body. It's when digestion ceases and is completely finished in the catabolic phase, when the body's burning off the calories that were stored, that's when the body can most effectively detoxify and repair and heal, and that's when the body removes metabolic wastes and toxins, like these free radicals we're talking about, and that's when the person feels shaky and weak and fatigued in the non-digestive phase. And they think that that non-digestive phase, which I call the catabolic phase, they feel uncomfortable when they hit the catabolic phase. And they think those symptoms are hunger. Because people think that feeling weak and tired is hunger. That's not hunger. That's, you're detoxing from your junk food diet, and they're so uncomfortable with those detox symptoms, they have to look for food. It makes them chronically overeat. It makes them unable to be, to even tolerate not digesting food for a little bit of time. It's like filling up your car with gasoline at the gas station, driving it one mile, and refilling it with another 20 gallons, or something like that. You didn't need more gas. It's not gonna go back into the tank anyway. There's no room in the tank to put the gas. But with the body, your body will expand, it'll accommodate more calories, and you can keep overfeeding itself. So take a look at this slide for a second, because I'm saying the anabolic phase, the glucose curve is going up, right? And then when the curve goes back to baseline and you stop digesting calories, that's when your body can more effectively repair and heal. I am saying that the longer you live in the catabolic phase of the digestive cycle, the longer you live. I'm saying that when you're chronically eating all the time and putting food in your mouth every four, 24 hours a day, you're shortening your lifespan because you need period of time without food coming in for your body to maximize its repair mechanisms and to remove buildup of excesses and waste products. But most Americans can't stop eating because they hit the catabolic phase and they feel shaky and weak and hypoglycemic because their body is so toxic. And they think the answer to their hypoglycemic is more tuna fish, more egg whites, more cheese, and more meat. Because more cocaine and more snorting and more cigarettes makes you feel better. But feeling better isn't getting better. Feeling better is getting worse. Feeling worse is getting better. <laughs> if I'm talking too fast, let me know. But I've got to get a lot of information out in an hour. And I want to get, this, get, you know, get you this information. So, of course, what I'm saying right now is that going through the catabolic phase in the first two-thirds of the catabolic phase, you're not burning much fat, you're mostly utilizing the stored glycogen in your liver, you're mostly burning more fat towards the last third of the catabolic phase when your glycogen reserves start to go down. So if you're constantly eating food and constantly putting stuff in your mouth, you're not gonna get to those, that fat burning. And a person who's healthy and they're a regular person who eats beans and greens and vegetables and berries and seeds and nuts and they eat a lot of healthy natural foods, they're not going to feel any hunger in the catabolic phase. They're going to feel nothing. 
you're not going to feel hungry, which is felt in really in the upper part of the chest and neck, lower part of the neck, with the pleasurable sensation that makes food taste good. You want not to eat until you're hungry. In other words, hunger is a precise computer directing you to the exact amount of calories to maintain your lean body mass. Hunger doesn't, doesn't exist to cause you to gain weight. You can't gain, put fat on your body from responding to hunger. You, to, in order to have become fat, you have to have eaten outside of the demands of true hunger. Do you understand that? You're eating because of toxic hunger, because of emotional eating, because of recreational eating, but it wasn't hunger that drives fat on the body. That's a mistake in the, sign of, in the medical or in the textbooks. Hun the human body, true hunger singles do not drive fat. Only false or toxic hunger singles drive fat storage. Because real hunger just exists to pre prevent gluconeogenesis, which is the breakdown of muscle tissue to make amino acid, to make glucose for the brain. Your body, the brain needs to function on glucose, and it can't break down fat to get glucose. It has to break down muscle tissue to get glucose. But the body wants to conserve its muscle tissue, so it will start to be hungry, real hungry, before it starts to get there. Hunger is protective against muscle and bone loss. It doesn't, it doesn't start to make you just eat willy-nilly for no reason. Toxic hunger, on the other hand, leads to overeating. People can't go without eating for even a few hours after digestion is ceases and they go from one eating occasion to the next all day long. They eat late at night. They could wake up in the middle of the night to eat even. But a person who's healthy doesn't want to con chronically eat. You bring a, a person brings this delicious tasting soup into my office, and they say, hey, Joel, I made this great soup for you. You've got to try it. It's really healthy, and it's really great. This recipe is great. And I'll say, great, thank you. Let me put it in my refrigerator, though, and I'll eat it when I'm hungry. I don't want to eat it right now, because when I'm hungry is when I'll really enjoy it fully, because then, because one of the symptoms of hunger is heightened sensations of taste. So the hunger grows throat sensation accompanied by increased taste sensation. Toxic hunger, on the other hand, is associated with headache and weakness of stomach cramping and growling and irritability, moody. Right, that's toxic hunger, that's not real hunger. Real hunger is not that uncomfortable, it's moderate. It's mostly associated with a sensation in your neck and throat and increased salivation and a dramatic heightened taste sensation. So to get rid of toxic hunger, you have to eat healthfully. Diets don't work, that's like telling people to breathe less oxygen. You can't just tell a person to cut back on calories willy-nilly, you have to give them a diet that's high in nutrients and volume so they're losing their toxic hunger and desire to overeat. And animal protein and sugar and high glycemic carbs and caffeine feed toxic hunger because they lead to withdrawal. Look, if you're drinking 10 cups of coffee a day and you try to stop coffee, you're going to feel better or worse? Worse! That's detoxification, but those detoxification symptoms simulate hunger because you feel shaky and weak and headachey, and it's relieved by eating food. Your caffeine withdrawal, withdrawal is mitigated by eating calories. People live to stimulate themselves, and they get very confused about how the body works. I can give you a drug to make your heartbeat slower, but I can give you a herbal product or a natural product to make your heartbeat slower, your heartbeat faster, to urinate your more, urinate less, to put you to sleep, to wake you up. To, but, but the pharmacologic or the efficacy of the the medicinal part of this natural compounds are the toxicity, the toxic part of the plant that has these effects, not the nutritive part of the plant. We're looking to live in a manner to avoid the need for medicinal substances, natural or otherwise. I can give you broccoli. There's no medicinal substance in broccoli. It doesn't make you feel better. It doesn't make you feel stronger. It doesn't give you more energy. It does nothing to you. You following me? You're feeling great all the time because you're not you don't want to stimulate the body. You're not looking to stimulate the body. You, you want to be able to be in touch with the amount of sleep you, you need. You don't want to cover the amount of, you don't want to take caffeine or stimulants to make so you don't feel when you're tired. You want to know when you're tired. When you listen to the body without the use of stimulants or natural or substances to try to change the expression of symptoms, that's when you're in good health. We want to have less dependency on health professionals, not more dependency. We want to be in control of our health destiny ourselves. This study, the Changing Perceptions of Hunger Study, published in 2010, showed that these individuals who followed this nutritarian diet, high in vegetables, this high vegetable, high plant diet, showed that their perception of hunger changed and lessened. So they weren't as hungry, losing their addictive drives to overeat, and they became desirous, naturally, of less calories. Here's a study published 
in 2012, where they showed that people who followed a nutritarian diet and higher in vegetables and beans and nuts and seeds had lost an average, if they were, ob if they were BMI was above 25, if they were in that, or above 30 in that higher category, they lost an average of 50, 50 pounds or more as the years progressed too. They continued to lose weight in year one and year two. So here's what I'm saying here. Number one, all of America's overweight, by the way. The whole population is overweight. So what are you health professionals? What are you, how many people, what percent of the population do you think is overweight? 70, okay. The American health authorities told us it was 66% five years ago, and three years ago they told us it was 70% of Americans were overweight. Do you think I agree with that? No, I don't. Because they use a BMI of 25's demarcation line between overweight and normal weight. And all long-lived societies, all blue zones, have BMIs below 23. The most more centenarians always generally have BMIs below 22 and a half. If we use 23 as a generous BMI of demarcation line, now we define 89% of Americans as being overweight, no longer 70% best by the U.S. health authorities. And also, look at that 11% of people that are normal weight in America, so-called normal weight. What about them? Do we scrutinize that population? The majority of them are cigarette smokers or alcoholics. The majority of them either have autoimmune conditions, occult cancers, or digestive disorders, or they smoke cigarettes uh, most, because those are the population that are thin because they have, some, they have some illness that's keeping them thin. They're not healthy people, the people that are normal weight. If they were healthy, they would have become overweight like everybody else. Because you can't live on the American diet and not become sickly and overweight and destroy your life. It's suicidal. How many people here have been shot by a bullet or stabbed by a knife? Raise your hand. Shot by a bullet. How, oh, better idea. What about your family or your close family members or personal closest friends either been shot by a bullet or stabbed by a knife? Raise your hand. Okay. Not even one person? Wow. All right. Oh, right here. Okay. Thank you. All right, how many here, family members, close family, or closest friends been either have a cancer diagnosis or a heart attack or a stroke? Raise your hand. That's a neighborhood you've got to get out of right away. Run away from that neighborhood right now and get out. You follow me? That's insanity. Insanity, doing what other Americans do. You've got to be crazy to eat food like America. Your brain's under attack. We know that... Fast foods and processed foods lower intelligence. We know that as children eat more fruits and vegetables, they're more intelligent. We know that we get that fast food and processed food linked to autism. Well, even when the mother eats the food, not just during pregnancy, but even her life before she gets pregnant, more fast food and junk from the mother, more allergies, autism, childhood cancers, and other problems and brain tumors in her offspring. We're destroying the fabric of our genetic code by, the, by this fast food and processed food revolution. Right? Work performance, attention deficits, hopelessness. The episodic glucose damages brain cells. And when you're diabetic and overweight, you have a higher risk of depression and higher risk of dementia. Yet we kid your, our children, go to a baseball game or a soccer game, and they sit there holding the glove in the field for 10 minutes, and they come off the field, and the mothers are giving them donuts to reward them. It's unbelievable. And who's the biggest objector? It's the people fighting against you know, we're trying to get the junk food out of the school systems. But the people who are opposing that are the mothers, who are the food addicts themselves. Because when you're a food addict, when you're an addict, you've lost the keys to the bank. You know what I mean by that? Your primitive brain's controlling your behavior. Your addictions control your behavior. Your decision making is impaired because your decisions are affected to try to retain and make excuses for and not consider the effects that addiction has on your behavior. We're poisoning our children. We already discussed processed food caused depression. And even, and you get withdrawal anxiety and withdrawal depression from processed foods. So this slide says that people who have a mental illness consume 69% of the nation's alcohol and 84% of the nation's cocaine. But I'm saying the opposite is true. I'm saying when you're consuming processed foods, you're going to eventually, and, and junk food and baked goods, you're going to be more likely to become dependent on alcohol and opiates and drugs and cocaine because you're going to destroy the brain and make you more looking for brain stimulation the more you get addicted to processed foods. And the gateway drug to more serious drug use is fast food and sugar and processed foods and fried foods. You have to be insane to eat fast food, right? So the brain's under attack. 
and there's a link between crime and the consumption of candy and sugar in the diet. For example, this British study showed that children who had the most candy consumption, who had a lot of candy and sugar before the age of 10, were the ones who developed become, to become violent criminals. If they had a high intake of sugar and candy in, in the, before age 10, they had a 69% chance of being a, arrested for a violent offense by age 34. Stunning. St isn't that amazing? When people are shooting up you know, nightclubs or shooting up schools, who's talking about the fact that they've burnt out their brains and become mentally angered and violent because of their consumption of junk food and fast food. Nobody's talking about this stuff. The primitive brain, the addictive brain, doesn't want to change. It's fighting to maintain its present addiction. Change promotes anxiety, and the subconscious mind is looking for excuses that it doesn't have to change. Some of you are listening to this and enjoying it and getting a lot of information from it, but some of you food addicts out there, your brain is trying to resist the information and saying, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, it sounds very good, but it's not for me, it's for somebody else. For me, my social life would be hurt, my, my can't eat that way if I work, it's too difficult because my friends, uh, you know, I, my life is too stressful. My, in other words, the food addict always, or the smoker, for example, the coconut addict, they always come up with some excuses and rationalizations why the change or the process won't work for them. Do you follow me? There's always a reason to fall back into their addiction again. There's no reason for you to go back and fall to your addiction again. Those excuses of your primitive brain, your primitive brain doesn't love you. It's not trying to help you. It wants to sustain its own addictions. The real cerebral you that loves you is take us, look at yourself 20 years from now, look back today and say, did I make the right decision back then for my life? And I look back at those 10 years and did I really take better care of myself so I have full mental faculties today? Are you going to consume marshmallows, white bread, donuts, pizza? Are you going to keep shoving garbage in your mouth? Right? Or not? Are you going to stop after that? Are you going to stop? Use your full cerebral brain, and it, that means that you need guidance, support, encouragement. Some people need you know, to be away in a cocaine rehab center or a re food rehab. Some people need help with their loved ones. If my daughter was a heroin addict or a cocaine addict, let's say I would keep her chained to my arm for, for months to make sure I, I wouldn't let her just go out in the world and get cocaine. If you had a friend, somebody you care about, you want to make sure they, get, they have a chance to get rid of their addictions and they need love and help to, to, to save their lives from the addictive nature of processed foods. Eric Clapton, he admitted that sugar was his gateway drug to heroin, but now we have people on drug addicts who come off their alcoholics and drugs and go back to eating sugar and donuts, right? This guy says heroin was his gateway drug. Overeating is an ethical dilemma. It takes away people's desire to be the full human being they can become. You can't change your desire to overeat calories and be a food addict unless you work on improving yourself. Because if you don't have self-esteem, then you're going to be affected by how people are seeing you. And in today's processed food environment, with everybody else committing suicide with food, you're not trying to please them and try to fit into the crowd of eating junk food. You've got to be, put the oxygen mask on yourself first and be a role model to get well. And what I'm saying here is that I'm going to try to impart superpowers on people, to give you superpowers. The real superpowers we need are the superpowers to heal our people who are suffering terribly of these medical tragedies that are killing their lives and causing immense amount of suffering. And those are the superpowers we all can have. That means taking care of your own health and being an example of excellent health is the starting point so you can be a role model and have the power and the knowledge to impart good health and affect other people in a positive way. And you can't do that unless you take care of your own health first. And if you're not going to eat healthfully and take care of your own health, then you can't be the mother, the best mother you can be, the best teacher you can be, the best doctor you can be, or the best friend you can be. You can't be the full human being with the full humanity and abilities and powers that you can be unless you're eating healthfully and taking care of your own health and being an, and being an example of good health. When guests come into my facility with drug food addiction, they stay there for two or three months. They're angry, they're coming off their alcohol or cigarettes, or whatever's happening to them. They're annoyed by every little thing. Their personalities change 
after a few months. They become happier and more excited about life, and they start to appreciate the beauty of natural foods, and they look at that passion fruit or that, and they, they say, this is the most gorgeous food, and it's so tasty, and it's so how nature put all these super ingredients right in there for to protect my brain, and they start to appreciate this beauty, this, the aesthetic structure of reality, and they start to think more kindly of other people and how they can help other people, and they, their whole personalities and their whole excitement about enthusiasm and creativity starts to become enhanced, and they start to look at the beauty around them, and they're, it's amazing how people's personalities change to be happier, more normal, and be more fulfilled and better human beings when they get rid of their addictions and start eating healthier. And it takes time. And to get better yeah, and to get well, you have to have a mindset of a champion. You have to encourage people to, that this is going to be difficult at the beginning. They have to be determination and perseverance, and they have to repeat over and over again and practice this and just do it right. When a person comes to me in my office and they sit across the table and I say to them, they're there with diabetes and psoriasis, and I say to them, look, are you just here to get drugs or to you know, get a little better or lose weight or you, or you really want to totally get rid of your diabetes and become non-diabetic, get off your blood pressure medications, get completely rid of your psoriasis, and get totally well, what do you want from me? Do you want me to take out all the stops so you can get totally better and get free of illnesses and get, or do you just want me to give you drugs and, get and, watch and talk to you about, you know, what do you want? They say, yeah, 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 give me everything. I want everything to do. I want to do the whole thing. I want to get totally well. I'll say, okay, then look, this is what you do. You don't decide what to eat. You don't figure out how much you want to eat, what you want to eat, what you think you should eat, what you like to eat. Well, none of those things matter. You're just gonna eat what I tell you to eat. I'm gonna make all those decisions for you. Whether you like it or not, whether you think, just do what I tell you to do. But I promise you that you'll eventually like it and you'll get such incredible results. Com combination with improving your taste and your smell and maybe even your sight. But you'll start to love this food once you learn the recipes and once you've given it months to strengthen your taste buds. But you have to get rid of all the foods you're eating right now in order to strengthen the taste buds, and you have to do, is do it right now whether you like it or not and give this time. It's like Roger Federer, the greatest tennis player in the world. He didn't just suddenly run around hitting that perfect stroke with his hips in the right place, with his hand coming back, with his elbow coming across his shoulder. He spent years and years of being doing this same movement over again and getting position. No, get your elbow higher. No, push off the back toe. No, bend your knee front knee a little more. No, straighten your back leg. No, twist your hip there. He got great coaching. It wasn't so he had to have the determination and the perseverance and the patience to not to be such a great, to not worry about where the ball went, to make sure that he had the stroke down perfect, and now he can run around the court and do the perfect motion automatically without thinking. He has that like $100 million arm just lifts up. <laughs> it's the same thing here. This is all about being skilled as a motivator and a teacher and every doctor should be running classes and lectures in their offices where motivating their patient population to take better care of their health, not just seeing patients one at a time and just dishing out medication. They should be coming in for group lessons and group classes and go together and motivating people and have social support. We have to change this path of medicine. And now when a person gets up here on the stage and says to you, we have to teach doctors about nutrition, I'm going, what? We don't wait till a person gets to be, go to a doctor with medical problems and then to learn about nutrition. The doctors don't have to learn about nutrition. It's, this has to be taught in the schoolrooms. We need everybody, our whole population, to become expert in nutrition. The teachers, the celebrities, the politicians, the librarians, the truck drivers, everybody has to learn about nutrition. It should be reading, writing, arithmetic, and nutritional excellence. Because we're, our society is being ravaged and destroyed by this, by, by the lack of nutritional information. The nutritarian eats a wide variety of nu high nutrient plants, like G bombs, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, foods with high anti cancer potential. The nutritarian gets rid of the empty calorie sweeteners, white flowers, processed foods, gets rid of the oils and animal products in their diet, and, he's all, and tries to use as much or, or, or occasionally uses those or as little as possible of things that are not in your best interest. The prescription here is to eat a large salad every day, to have at least an ounce or two of nuts and seeds a day, to eat half a cup of beans at least a day, to eat a large serving of cooked vegetables a day too, not just raw vegetables, a large serving of cooked and raw, to eat a variety, eat mushrooms and onions in your diet, to eat at least three, three fresh fruits a day, get the full variety 
of natural plant foods in your diet because when you have the full orchestra playing of all those different nutrients and fibers, you get the full anti-cancer benefits of a diet. Now, when you start out as a white belt, to try to eat healthy, you feel worse. You don't feel better. You're getting on toxic hunger, right? People feel worse when they start this out. If they don't know this, they're never going to succeed. If they don't know that they're not going to feel better when they start doing this, they're not going to like it, and they're going to feel ill all the time. It's after they're doing it a while, a yellow belt, an orange belt, a brown belt, and a black belt, they desire to eat this food the most. This is the food they prefer to eat. This is the food they love to eat at this point. And if they try to eat something unhealthy, they feel crappy. I don't have time to go over these different levels here and how it happens, but I, because I want to show you a few cases. Here's Scott, who lost over 300 pounds, who kept losing weight when he no longer wanted to lose weight anymore. His final weight was actually 175, not 182, we thought, but he stays with the program. He's just enjoying eating this way. And Ronnie, who had bypass surgery, four years later had triple angioplasty after his bypass surgery. Look at him there in July of 2008 on Lipitor 20 with an LDL of 148, look at him one there a year later off Lipitor with an LDL of 78 with almost no oxidized LDL, right, where his blood pressure was, couldn't come down on three medications, but there he is a year later off medication, right, he's lost over 140 pounds in one year, over 140 of scale and went up to 300 pounds. Going through these cases, look at Emily who lost about 100 pounds in a year. I want you to look up at her face and see when she's no longer depressed and allergic, and sickly. Look at how much younger the tone of her skin, the color of her skin. These nutrients penetrate the skin and are protective effects against skin cancer. And, oh, that was my last slide. So we're saying here that my time is up, but not your time with this information that you can take home, learn more, and start incorporating into your life. And the first thing I want you to do is see how you can improve your own diets right now and see if you could start to utilize nutritional excellence to get rid of the fear in your life, get you the freedom you need to live life to your fullest, to expand your play span your happiness and your enthusiasm about living, because that's what this is all about, being more excited about living, getting rid of the fear, and recognizing that we have a body that's already resistant to disease. And we feed it right. Okay, a pleasure talking to you, wishing you all great health and much happiness. Thank you so much. A round of applause for Dr. Joel Furman. Thank you so much, Joel, for being here today. Thank you. Tremendous, tremendous lecture.